Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rachel Smith and I just want to give you a little bit of background on myself. I'm currently a diesel mechanic. Um, used to be a truck driver for about 10 years and before that I was in the army and when I was in the army I was a medic. So one of the things that soldiers are always taught whenever they're in the army is if you were to get a serious injury and you were in the field one of the first things you're going to shout for is not your mama and it's not going to be hey bro come help me you're going to shout medic so that's one of the things that we're taught is to shout medic when we really need help and Thankfully, I've never been in a situation where people really had to scream medic, but if I ever was, I would have been prepared to run into battle no matter what odds I would be facing. We're trained to ignore the danger around us and save those who are most important. So the title of my message is simply medic because sometimes that's the way we end up calling out to the Lord. So I want to kind of share with you my text here and then give you a little context behind it. If you'll turn your Bibles to Matthew 9, 9 through 12. It says, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened, as Jesus sat at the table in that house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners into repentance. Now, to give you a little context of this verse, at the beginning here in verse 9 where it says, As Jesus passed on from there. That's a really great way to sum up saying, in just the verses before, is whenever Jesus he healed the paralytic that was brought in from the roof. And he said, Sons, your sins are forgiven rise and walk so his as he passed on from there is, is greater than anything we'll ever do in our entire lives and you know the other thing is tax collectors in this day who is who Jesus chose uh, chose Matthew to be his disciple and the tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples in that time frame tax collectors were seen as like the uh, out of the Jews they were seen as the worst of the Jews because they were siding with the enemy they were siding with the Romans they were helping to collect taxes against their own people uh, in America today I think that um, we have something similar and that's just pretty much whenever you see someone of the opposing political party to your limited views and you think that they are the most evil person and the enemy but really they're not and Jesus loves them just as much as he loves you so kind of what I want to go into here is I just want to ask like have you ever wondered why you feel pain like why you feel pain inside of you and have you ever struggled and fought with an enemy that you can't see an enemy that you can only feel in your heart Whenever I was a medic in the army, one of the most important things that we learned was how to be able to control bleeding and how to treat different types of wounds. So there's three main ways that we could treat bleeding wounds. We could treat capillary wounds. That's basically, you need a band-aid. That's, oh man, I fell, you know, and I scraped my elbow. And if someone screamed medic for that, we're probably just going to toss you some, you know, socks and ibuprofen and tell you to drink some water, go on your way. Tend to do that for more serious wounds too, but we'll get to that later. So then we have venous bleeding. 
Vein is bleeding is whenever you're going to apply pressure. You have to hold the wound down to keep it from bleeding. It's not serious enough to kill you, but it's still serious enough that you have to control the bleeding before it gets a whole lot worse. And then there's the most serious type of bleeding. This is a type of bleeding that if it is not stopped immediately, you will die. That's arterial bleeding. And the only way to control arterial bleeding is by use of a tourniquet. And I guess what I want to compare this to is that our, our internal wounds often reflect this same process. We treat them in different ways. Sometimes our minor wounds are things our capillary wounds on the inside are more like criticism or rejection by a friend or something at work. And, you know, whether or not they're interested in us for a date, things like that. Whereas, like, somewhere in the middle, venous bleeding internally is more like a job loss or a breakup. We have to apply pressure we have to, you know, try to recover from that. It's not the end of the world, but in that moment, it can still be really scary. And then we have internally arterial bleeding. This is something that is absolutely life-changing, like the loss of someone really close to you, like a parent or a best friend. It's trauma. It's something that shakes you to your absolute core. Maybe it's divorce. Maybe it's childhood abuse that you are still trying to heal from that affects every relationship that you've ever tried to be in in your life. You know, maybe it's losing your best friend and you don't know how you're going to move forward. The thing is that any of the things I just mentioned can be any series of wounds uh, described in different times of our lives. Sometimes that rejection from someone that you were interested in dating, in that moment, it feels like that venous bleeding. It feels like that arterial bleeding. But other things go much deeper than that, and they hurt for much longer. And after a while, all we do is just try to bandage it up. We just try to apply pressure to it and hope that other people won't see our wounds. And, you know, that's why I personally feel that you shouldn't judge people who hurt differently than you, because you never know what kind of pain somebody else is in that maybe to you seems minor. That's why, for me personally, I hate, absolutely hate the term, you need to have some thick skin, or you just got to have some thick skin. Sometimes it's not that simple. And what wasn't painful for you it could be painful for someone else. And sometimes the same people who will tell you you need to have thick skin about something are actually hurt by the exact same thing. They just don't want to let you know that it hurt them. They're putting up a wall. So, you know, a good rule of thumb, I usually, you know, tell my kids is I'm like, you know, if something has a nickname, don't put it inside of you. Uh, that's, that's a good rule of thumb. <laughs> so uh, when you bind up a wound what you're really doing is is treating the symptom but no matter how well the wound is bound there's there's one thing that the pressure brand the bandage in a tourniquet can't do whether it's an internal wound or it's an external wound it cannot heal the wound it is simply just binding up the bleeding it's just trying to stop it for a little while it's a temporary solution healing has to occur from the inside out that's why anything you can use to put in your body, like I said, telling the kids, don't put anything in your body that's got a nickname to it, it just bandages your heart temporarily and it's never permanent. It only hides the wound and only binds the wound for a little while before it starts bleeding again. So it's no coincidence that every drug on the planet must be consumed, injected, or inhaled some other way it has to get into the body so before 
we go and start judging people and telling the man on the sidewalk that he's a sinner for using a tourniquet around his arm to ingest heroin into his veins to kill the pain. We may want to think about the fact that they're having arterial bleeding in their soul and it's a bleeding they can't control. They don't understand how to control it any other way other than to just try to numb it and make it feel dead for a little while. So that's why you need to understand that your pain and the bleeding of your soul is just as dangerous. So no matter the amount of blood loss, is you lose enough, you will die. And it's the same whether it's external or internal. People can be so hurt that it kills them. And that's why we have to, as the church, love other people. We have to bring them up. We have to show them the love of Christ and show them that this is not all that there is. Life can get better. You can be healed. And life can be new. It can be healed and it can go on. So when pain sits and builds and bleeds slowly, it's, that's when it's the most dangerous to your soul. Because you're dying and you don't even notice it. So, but don't misunderstand me though, because just because you don't do drugs doesn't mean you're not hiding your wounds. Some people use pornography. Some people use like Netflix binges. Some people use cupcakes. Personally, I, I like cupcakes. Um, that would probably be mine, maybe with the Netflix and, um, you know, just posting a selfie every once in a while just to, you know, make sure that I still look pretty. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we all do it. We all find ways to self-medicate in one shape or another. You know, some people even do healthy things to help cover up things inside. Personally, I love to go to the gym. I love to work out. But I do know people that for them, it's not as much a time of healing as is a time to try to forget everything that's going on in life. And while it is a great stress reliever, it can become an idol in your life. So, you know, I, I do want to give a caveat here. So before you go tell someone I, I told you that you're using cupcakes to stop the internal bleeding in your soul and make me sound really weird. Uh, and, and then they just ask you, like, well, why wouldn't you just use a tampon if you're bleeding? And I, I'm sorry, I know that's the first time you've probably ever heard the word tampon used in a sermon, but uh, we're all adults. So you have to get over it, go to the store, buy something for your wife that's nice, and uh, maybe she'll forgive you for all that <laughs> but I do have good news for you and for anyone that is wounded from the inside out anybody who's hurt or bleeding from their heart and their soul there is one who won't just bind your wounds he'll heal them from the inside out because he's not a medic he's a physician and he's not dead he's resurrected He's not in the grave, he's on the throne. And there is only one name, and that name is Jesus Christ. There's only one way, one savior, and one healer. And he doesn't want you to walk around with your pain and your wounds forever. He wants to heal you, and he wants to save your life. Me personally, I walked around having post-traumatic stress disorder from military sexual trauma as well as a near-death experience in the army. I walked around with PTSD for 10 years before I allowed God to heal me. And you, and you did hear that correctly. I said before I allowed God to heal me. I was so convinced that things could never get better, that this is just the way it was, that I was just cursed and that God would just have to you know, help me with this. I would just have to deal with it forever. I didn't realize that I could ever be fully healed from it. You know, I tried to self-medicate in the beginning. Drugs, alcohol, sex, relationships, you name it. Kind of calmed down after uh, a little bit of a wild time. You know, was getting back into my relationship with Christ. And the healing process was beginning. But it would still be another seven years before I could stand before you and tell you that I no longer have PTSD. And what made the difference for me was acknowledging, one, that I couldn't do it on my own. That I was tired of being this way. That I desperately needed help. And I didn't need to just surrender to God 
and, and, and that, of course, is the most important part. I needed to surrender this to Jesus. But I had to be willing to accept help from other people as well. I had to humble myself before the Lord so that he could change my life and change the course of my career, my family, and the direction that he wanted to ultimately take me. So I just want you to know that there's only three things that will stop Jesus from healing you from the inside out. An unyielding heart, an unwilling mind, and an unbelieving soul. Because healing and forgiveness are synonymous with each other. And that is part of what Jesus is saying when he's letting people know. Those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. God's not asking you to be perfect. He's not asking you to be healed before you come to him, to have your life together. He doesn't care if the day before you were sitting in your bathroom with a gun to your head, thinking about whether or not can you really make it one more day he also doesn't care whether the day before you won a million dollars and you're doing really well for yourself and you've got you know chicks on your left and your right same god died for both of us the same jesus wants to heal and forgive both people the main thing standing in your way is your own pride Jesus will never give you healing or forgiveness without the other. They have to go together. And that's why he experienced the ultimate suffering and the deepest wounds. So that when he was crucified, he could heal and forgive yours. So right now, I know this message is kind of heavy, but... I just want to encourage you tonight that there is no pain, no wound, no heartache that Jesus can't heal. But the healing process begins first with surrendering your care to the physician. So tonight, if you're willing, I ask that you please bow your heads and close your eyes and pray this prayer with me. Lord, I know I have wounds that need to be healed. I've tried to heal them on my own and I can't. I ask you in Jesus' name to forgive me, heal me, and transform me by the power of your blood shed on the cross for me, and ask the resurrected Christ to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And if you pray that prayer with me, I just ask, you know, with nobody looking around the room, that you please just raise your hand and acknowledge that you're ready to begin to heal. And it begins in your new life in Christ Jesus.